I'm Thomas Betts. This is uh, welcome, welcome to Leveling Up Your Architecture Game. Uh, I am not Suzanne Kaiser. She's there. She'll be here tomorrow. Glad you made it. Uh, so a couple days ago, I was walking around downtown Denver uh, when there were clear blue skies and not you know, 10 inches of snow, and I asked random people on the street for examples of architecture. And they, it's great, because they can point to all these lovely buildings and structures around Denver, some of them hundreds of years old, and that's not on the screen yet. There it goes. Sorry. Lots of technical difficulties. We'll roll with it. Um, they pointed to all these great things, and when you ask people about architecture, there's that shared collective understanding. We know what architecture is. And I said, oh no, I'm a software architect. Can you give me examples of software architecture? And they looked at me funny, and then they had to be somewhere else. But I'm at a software conference, Explore DD, and I figured I'd ask technical people. So I asked some other attendees for examples of software architecture that they could point to, and they showed me diagrams. And I guess that's fine, but it's just a representation. It's not the actual architecture. We don't have that physical building to point at. It's just a little bit harder to define because it's electrons, not molecules. And if software architecture is hard to define, what about the role of a software architect? Well, imagine you're at a party, and people are going around introducing themselves. What do you do? I'm an architect. They go, oh, that must be really cool, designing buildings. If you say, I'm a software architect, you know what you get? Uh-huh, you get the little bobblehead, and they sip their drink, and they think, I have no idea what that guy does. Um, I sometimes default to my mom's answer, which is, I do something with computers. It's accurate. So. If we don't know what software architecture is, and we don't know what software architects do, how are we supposed to get better at this? Well, we focus on the fundamentals. Go to the core things that we need to do. What are the job responsibilities? And what are the skills we need to, in, to reach those goals? Once we have those individual skills, we can use them as building blocks to create a framework. One thing I know about software architects, they love creating frameworks. So I'm Thomas Betts. Uh, if you recognize my name for any reason, it's probably from InfoQ. I've been the lead editor for architecture and design uh, for several years. Uh, I also co-host the podcast. I've done stuff with QCon, which is InfoQ's conferences. Um, and I bring that up because most of the ideas I'm sharing today aren't my own. It's the community of knowledge. And one of the uh, core values of InfoQ is we are information Robin Hoods. This is a chance to share that knowledge with a broader audience. So I'm hoping you learned something. In my day job, I am an application architect at Blackbaud, which is not a name people know. It's a 40-year-old software company. We've been around a while. Um, it's the largest software provider for the social impact community. So nonprofits, K through 12, foundations, stuff like that, they use our stuff. Um, but in the interest of full disclosure, look me up in the HR system, and it says Laureate Software Engineer, because HR is not going to try and figure out what an architect does. So today, we're going to talk about those responsibilities of architects, and then what are the fundamental skills you need to achieve those, those goals. And once we know what they are, how do we level up? Now, from this point on, I'm done talking about buildings. It's all software, but I think we're on the same page, right? I'm just trying to shorten the speech a little bit. Um, so one thing that architects are typically known for, and I will say at some companies, all they're known for are those diagrams. And that's fine, but that's not the sole job. The diagrams are just one product that can be useful. Thinking about a system, designing the components and the interactions, that's the job. The, the diagram is just one tangible output. Now, I make that distinction because if we can focus on the fundamental skills, those have broad applicability. We can use them for lots of different parts of the job. And that breadth of applicability is crucial to being a next-level architect. And if we can improve the practice of architecture, then that means we're going to make better software, and our software is going to actually improve as we level up how we do our jobs. Now, the work that an architect does will vary a lot from company to company, and even within a company, you'll see different things. But there's some things you always have to do. Understanding business and technical requirements. You know, then you take those, and you have to make technical decisions. You have to design software systems. And architects are also responsible for explaining those design decisions to stakeholders. And Explore DDD is a great conference, because I bet one of those bullet points will be the subject of pretty much every talk at this conference. But 
Notice that none of those responsibilities say you have to be an architect. You don't have to go get certified and get a degree in architecture. Uh, show of hands, who has an architect in their title? Well, that's a decent amount. How many people have done one of those things? Yeah, that's the whole room. That's what I thought. And that's because anyone can practice architecture. Yeah, we're going to have the enterprise architects, systems architects, application architects. But if you are a lead engineer, you have some level of architecture responsibility. And really, I think everyone does. The, the, scope, the, pro, the difference isn't what you're doing, it's the scope of the influence that your decisions can have. And I want to point out that leveling up your architecture game, I'm not talking about getting promoted and moving up the org chart and getting a, a different job title. Anyone can use these skills and get better at whatever they're doing right now. So that gets us to the, the fundamental skills we need to practice. There's four of them, and they build upon each other. The base of everything is good communication. Second is decision making. Now, I've already said that one of the primary responsibilities is making decisions, so wouldn't that be first? But trust me, it comes second to communication. After that is adaptability, and finally, leadership. Now, all four of those are important, and on any given day, you might you know, leverage one more than the other, but this is the base rank, so let's get into them. So every, the number one most important skill for an architect is communication. Why do I think that? Because every software problem is fundamentally a communication problem. I'll say that again. Every software problem is fundamentally a communication problem. That's true when there's two machines that are trying to communicate with each other, or someone's writing code and telling the computer what to do, or two people talking about software. Maybe some examples will help. Who's ever seen a 400 bad request come back? Yeah, this is in the HTTP spec, which specifies how we're going to communicate between servers over HTTP. It's the first of the client errors. Like, it's the most common thing. And what does it mean? It's the server saying, I don't know what you meant, and just throwing that back to the client. What about DNS? I think people like to say that every problem is a DNS problem, and while it's true, what is DNS? It's just a way to help us communicate, help me find who I'm trying to talk to. So when DNS is broken, it's still a communication problem. Or maybe we get to a point where, oh, this doesn't meet requirements, or that doesn't match the design. There's a breakdown in communication. Either you didn't explain it well, or you didn't actually write down the requirements, or someone just created a bug because there was an edge case. It doesn't matter. Communi bad communication is what causes all these things. So if every software problem is fundamentally a communication problem, that means the biggest impact that an architect can have is by improving communication. I'll say that again. Because every problem we encounter in software is fundamentally a communication problem, we can make a difference by, by improving our communication. We can improve how our systems talk to each other. We can improve how people write the software. We can improve how two people talk and reason about the software. Architects are able to make positive impact in all of those communication paths. So if we want to improve how we communicate, how do we learn how to do that? We go back to the fundamentals. Now, I know people are going to say, kindergarten, right? No. I'm not going to go back that far. You, you learn good stuff in kindergarten. But for the purpose of this talk, everything you need to know about communication, I learned in English Composition 101 in college. For those that haven't had a US education, most universities here for first year students make you take a freshman composition writing course. Why? because you have to write in pretty much every other course, no matter what your major is, no matter what you're studying. If you can't communicate effectively in, when you're writing things down, it doesn't matter. That's also why they encourage oral communication in speech classes. But don't worry, I'm not going to turn this into a college lecture. It's a three-word phrase I think you need to remember that I, is all I took from my English composition class. Know your audience. That's it. Always consider who you're talking to, what information you're trying to convey, and how best to get your point across. Now, those architecture diagrams, they can be useful, but are they the right thing for every audience? You might need to write out a document, or give a presentation, or send an email. What the developers need are different than what business stakeholders need. And knowing your audience is just critical when you're communicating out. But communication is always two-sided. So if that helps us 
communicate out, how do we help receive, how we learn to get better at receiving information? It's one of those obvious things when you put it on a slide and you're like, well, duh, but ask questions. I've sat in so many teams where we're trying to implement what we've been told to build, and somebody goes, oh, if they'd only ask me, I would have given them a better information, they could have made a better decision. There's also the idea of question every assumption. Don't assume that you have all the answers. But if you ask questions, it's your responsibility to listen to the answers. They might not be exactly what you think, and there may be valid points, there may be some valid points, and some of it might be wrong, but bring those together. Consider the other options, and then provide a reasoned argument for, for or against whatever someone's suggesting. Because you have to take the time as architects to understand all the options and come up with the right answer. It's never usually a yes or no um, decision. But that gets us to the next skill, decision making. Um, this, like I said, is the primary responsibility of, of software architects, making decisions. Now, when you're making decisions, there's basically a formula you go through. And I've thought of this as like the scientific method, if you ever had to do that for experiments, right? Um, starts with understanding the decision that you need to make, then you come up with some options. You evaluate those and decide on one. And once you've done, you have to communicate your decision. Now, if you look at that, the first and the last emphasize communication. If you don't know what you're supposed to be thinking about, everything else after that might be wrong. You might solve the wrong problem or solve the problem incorrectly. And if you can't communicate what your decision is, how do you know they're gonna, whoever's going to go implement that does it correctly? We'll come back to that. I want to focus first on the core, which is making the decision. How do we come up with the options? And this gets to one of the things that architects are known for. You ask an architect any question, they have a two-word response. Wow. You guys want to give the rest of the presentation? Yeah. But what, what's the follow-up question? What does it depend on? That's your decision criteria. You know, sometimes you're provided specific functional requirements. I need to store 10 megabyte file, uh, file attachments up to 10 megabytes. Sure, or we have a response time under 500 milliseconds. That's great. More often, architects deal with the non-functional requirements, the NFRs. Sometimes these are called the illities, the scalability, availability, performance, security, things that don't end in illity, but we lump them on in there. Um, also, uh, the term quality attribute requirements, QARs, comes into play. And then architects sometimes have to be involved in cost decisions. If you're doing a build versus buy option, that's clearly about cost. But usually there's some component of, you know, are we going to go serverless? Are we going to go EC2? Whatever it is, cost usually works in somewhere. So how do we evaluate these non-functional requirements? Well, when you can, if they, don't have, if they can give you a number and you can quantify it, that's great. But especially early on when you're not quite sure what your system's going to do, the best you might be able to do is just rank them in order of importance. And no, you don't get to have 10 number one priorities. I've had to do 10 number one priorities. It doesn't work out. Um, like, if you're starting off, do you care more about scalability or performance? Well, we don't have a million users. We might have 100 users. So scalability probably isn't the biggest factor, and the performance is good enough. But that might change over time. So what quality attributes are the most important? It depends. Now, once you've evaluated your options and you've decided on the one that you think is quote unquote best, you need to communicate that decision. And this is the fifth step in our scientific method. So what's the most effective way to communicate your decisions? Well, it depends. It might be those diagrams. Maybe you like something really rigid and formal like SysML or UML, or you just like draw some boxes and arrows and call it good enough. Uh, my, one of my recommendations is Simon Brown's C4 model for software architecture. Um, and the C4 is a hierarchy called, I'm going to test myself, context, containers, components, and code. And the thing is, whenever you're communicating those decisions, it's all about you need to know know your audience. And C4 is great because every level of that hierarchy of diagrams can have a slightly different audience. The developers care more about the code, or maybe they just compare about the components, but you're talking to business stakeholders, they care more about the context. But even the best diagrams have limitations. 
because the diagram is just a model. And I'm pretty sure someone said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Diagrams are useful because they show what to build. But critically, what they leave out is why you think it should be built that way. We went through this whole decision-making process. We evaluated multiple options, and we chose one. The diagram only shows the winner. Imagine watching the Olympics, and the only coverage you see is the gold medals. You don't get to see any of the other athletes, none of the competition. Something's missing, right? The other problem with diagrams is they are notoriously out of date. Because when do you need to change your diagrams? You need to change your diagrams any time one of your decisions change. And too often we have these implicit changes. We drew the diagram and said, go for it. And then a month later, it's like, well, that didn't work. We're just going to implement it a little bit differently. Go back and update the diagram. Never gets said. Nobody does that. It's not a thing. And sometimes you don't know how stale they are. So there's things we can do that are better than diagrams. And this is where I like architecture decision records, ADRs. This term was first coined by Michael Nygaard back in 2011. And the value of ADRs is that they help explain the why behind the decision. Now, it's based on a lightweight template that, if you look at it, follows that scientific method. You know, what's the decision we're going to make? What are you considering? What did you decide upon? And now it's written down, you've basically answered the communicate your decision. The other benefit of having ADRs, anyone stared in front of a blank whiteboard for a while with this look? Like, you try and draw the end state. You try and get to the end. You try to get that gold medal without having to think through the process. You're doing it mentally, but you don't draw it out. And I think that ADR is just having a template to follow, for me, is a lot better than that whiteboard. You get past that initial analysis paralysis. Now, I know some people, especially people who raise their hands for architect, are probably more comfortable drawing the boxes and arrows than writing out a lot of words. This isn't a lot of writing. It's a, it, there's an emphasis on it being lean and lightweight. I personally love using Markdown. Like, don't even open up Word. Don't have some, it's just text. Um, and there's a library out there called Mater, which has a CLI you can install and type Mater new and give it the name of the decision. You get a new file, and it gets numbered and everything. Um, and if you still want your pretty pictures, has anyone used Mermaid, Mermaid.js? Yeah, great little tool for doing inline diagrams. Um, so you can still have your pictures if you need them, but because it's Mermaid, you can't do a whole lot. It's really to help me make the decision. And then you can say this versus that and see them side by side. Um, so when I use Mater, type in a new document, gives you a header at the top. The header is really useful. Every ADR has a new ID, so you can tell them apart, just an integer. Um, and then it's got the name of the decision, basic stuff. The date goes on there. That way you can look at this and immediately know how stale is it. Was this a decision from last week, last month, last year? The deciders, really important, because that's who to blame. I mean, that's who to go talk to when you have a question about the decision. It, if it's just like your code, and you say, who wrote this code, and you check the Git history, and it turns out you were the idiot who wrote that code, I might be the idiot who wrote that decision, and I forgot, but now I want to change my mind. And that's the next step, is changing your mind is allowed, but treat these as immutable. There's an initial period where they're pending, and you say, OK, this is, you know, we're still figuring it out. And then you decide the decision. It's approved. And at that point, the only change you should be making to that decision record is to say, this has been superseded. And I created a new decision that, over, over, that takes over from this one. Um, oh, and again, I love them being a text file. I put them in source control right in my code repo so that the developers working on the project can go see all the architecture decisions. Don't hide them in some magic SharePoint site or a wiki or a shared drive that nobody seems to have access to or remembers to go update. Put them right close to where you are. It'll get, more, it'll get used more often, and they'll be more up to date. So we've gotten through our first two superpowers. We have better communication because we know our audience, and we're making and communicating our decisions better because we're using ADRs. The, next, the third skill for leveling up is adaptability. Because planning is really important, but nothing ever goes exactly as planned. And the Agile Manifesto describes this as responding to change over following a plan. So 
how do we improve how we respond to change? Well, responding to change really means that we need to update one or more of our decisions. Now, hopefully, our main target goal hasn't changed. We're not like abandoning the project. It's just like, well, this isn't working quite right. So you need to change direction slightly, but a small course correction, and you keep heading towards your goal. If we've documented our decision-making process, and we need to change our decision, we can go back and read that ADR. And now we can supersede the new decision. Instead of what I've seen happen too many times, which is, this isn't working, throw it all out, we're going to start over. A better option is you go back and read the ADR, and you see, oh, our circumstances have changed. Oh, that assumption we made that made us say option A was better than option B, that wasn't a valid assumption anymore. We should go with option B now, because this is the current state. And by having that decision written down, you're able to make smaller, more incremental changes. That means you're going to have a more agile architecture. And we spent decades trying to make software more agile, software development more agile. Architecture's been playing catch up. But if we want our architecture to be agile, it has to respond to change. Now, some of the ideas about how to do this um, come from a book, Continuous Architecture, and then Continuous Architecture and Practice by Pierre Pure and a few other people. And then they started writing an article series on InfoQ, and it's now like over a year old. Um, they keep adding stuff every month. Um, they were on a podcast. I think that podcast just went live on Tuesday, so it's very fresh. Um, one of the ideas that they talk about with Continuous Architecture, and the articles built on the ideas from the book, um, is the minimum viable architecture. If you'll have heard of an MVP, the minimum viable product, the minimum viable architecture is the architecture that supports your MVP. And what's great is this gives you a chance to validate your decisions. And it really says that it's the minimum viable architecture. Don't architect for two years down the road. Architect for what you need right now. Maybe architect for the next month or the quarter. And then the product catches up, and then the product gets successful, and all of a sudden it's outgrown that little bit of architecture, and then the architecture catches up. The metaphor they used was two rock climbers that are tied together with a rope. Either one can be up in front, but they can't get too far apart. And because we're using our decisions, and we're making decisions based on small changes right now, that means our architecture is able to evolve because we expect our decisions to continuously evolve. Um, so I highly recommend checking out some of those articles and listening to the podcast where we kind of summarize everything that we've been doing the last year. Um, another viewpoint of this, Rebecca Parsons, CTO of ThoughtWorks, was co-author of Evolutionary Architecture, and I talked to her about how evolutionary architecture has evolved because they published version two of their book, so what changed about evolution? And it turns out that even your ideas of how your architecture can evolve, those ideas evolve. So you have to keep, keep revisiting what you're gonna do. Now, we want the architecture of our system to be agile, but we, as architects, also need to be agile in how we do our jobs. This goes back to the idea that architects design software and they practice architecture. Like, what are you doing? Now, I'm not the first person to reference the COVID pandemic, so I'm, I feel okay bringing this up, but you may have noticed that work habits have changed. And most people that I've talked to went from, I work in an office every day, to, I don't go into the office ever, or very rarely. That hybrid and re remote work is now just the new normal. Um, and when that first happened, how many people had communication challenges? Like, how do I communicate with my team? I just walked in before, and we were all there, and we talked to each other. Oh, there was that one guy who was remote. Yeah, that was a problem, and now it levels the playing field. And that's why we're find we found new communication opportunities. Things like more asynchronous communication, don't rely on everyone being in the room, taking all the meeting rooms, as Chris mentioned this morning. You know, don't rely on that. If you can write it down and share it, and then people can read it and comment, that's great. ADRs support that. And I think this is even better than what we used to have, which is that's the conference room the architects go into, and they draw on the whiteboard, and maybe you got a, a screenshot, a picture of the whiteboard to go, go and implement this. But you weren't in the conversation. You weren't there when they're deciding things. You don't understand why the decisions were made. The ADRs have actually are a way to improve your communication. We're also seeing that these changes in work habits are influencing the software that gets built. Um, 
Conway's law gets called out a lot, especially at Explore DDD, right? We, want the, we know that the architecture of our system is going to reflect the structure of our organization. Well, I noticed something that I've called the COVID corollary to Conway's law, which is that effective distributed teams are able to build effective distributed software. And this is actually more visible in the flip side, that if you and your team struggled when everybody got distributed, it's going to be real hard for you to build distributed software. Maybe you should still be building a monolith if you have to go into the office every day to talk to each other. Another thing is adapt, being adaptable and adaptation, that's always changing, right? Architects love talking about the illities. Turns out we get new illities thrown at us all the time. Now we have design for sustainability, reduce your carbon footprint. That's another responsibility that architects have to consider when they're building their systems. Didn't have that. We should have had that, but we didn't think about that so much five, 10 years ago. And we're now at a state where software uses more carbon than the airline industry. We also have thing, illities that we had that are evolving. Extensibility was something we always had, like create APIs, we're API first. But the audience of that API was professional developers. They were going to pull up Java or C Sharp or whatever language and communicate their API. And then it evolved to, I want to have low code, no code solutions where citizen, de citizen developers can just throw stuff together and connect systems. And it's evolving into the LLMs are just going to write all that code and they're going to connect your systems. So you need to have your extensibility anticipate those changes. And really, this gets to the idea of you have to design for the future. But as I said, you don't want to make a design that's solving your scalability challenges two, three, five years down the road. You need to be able to adapt your system. So design it for right now with the idea that you will change it on, as it goes on. So we're now at the, the fourth, um, last of our four skills for great architecture, architects is leadership. Um, one of the things InfoQ is known for is we put together trends reports, and I'm responsible for the architecture and design trends report. And every year, one of the topics that's been on there has been architect as a technical leader. Because software architecting is a skill that all developers need. Experienced architects have an obligation to share their experience and help others. Now, several years ago, I worked at Nordstrom. There might be one person in the room who still does. Um, uh, if for those that don't know, I know there's people from international audience here, uh, Nordstrom is a high-end department store that is known for impeccable customer service. And how do they embody that? They have an inverted pyramid. Their org chart doesn't have the CEO at the top. CEO is at the very bottom. The customers are at the top. The closer you are to the customer, the higher you are. You're selling shoes, you're the number one guy on the org chart. I was somewhere in the middle. But I supported the other engineers on my team. That was my responsibility. And that idea doesn't require you to actually have an org chart that looks like that and the, and the mindset of it. But the idea of servant leadership, that, that applies in any situation. And you know, that means as an architect, I don't get to be hands off. I don't get to draw the diagram, throw it over the wall and say, go implement it. I have to interact with the team. And that's why I really appreciated talking with Andrew Harmelaw about what he described in an article as the architecture advice process. One of the key takeaways from that conversation was anyone can make an architectural decision. But there's two caveats. They have to consult with the people that will be affected by the decision, and they have to consult with the people who have relevant experience. Now, more junior employees might not know all those people that the architect might. So you can help facilitate those conversations, or you might be the expert who can provide the knowledge. But I want to see more people training the engineers who are then writing the code to solve these problems. The worst case I've ever seen is where every engineer has just gotten into the culture mindset of the architects tell us what to do, or someone tells me what to do. And they stare at a deer, you know, have the deer in the headlights look when they're faced with an unknown situation. Software is all about dealing with uncertainty. So we need to pass that skill on so that they can get better at making decisions. And um, another way you do this is if your ADRs are in source control, like I talked about, that can serve as an example of how to go through the decision-making process. So work with them, help them write them, and write them yourself and put them where everyone can see. Um, so that's the four important skills. Let's 
put all that together and we'll go some th through some practical examples and some recommended reading. Um, I am not one to be afraid of changing my slides right before I get on stage, and since everyone else had an Albert Einstein quote so far today, I felt I needed one. Um, so I looked it up. He said we should use microservices, unless you should use a monolith. Um, I'm pretty sure he said that. Maybe. So reviewing the four skills of great software architects. Communication, decision-making, adaptability, and leadership. Now, oh, maybe you're wondering, it's like, he said I was going to level up my architecting skills, and he didn't mention Kubernetes. He didn't say stream processing or Kafka and barely hinted at AI. So the thing is, architecting is not a game of buzzword bingo. You know, those tools and technologies will come and go. You need to use your critical thinking skills and good decision making to understand, is this tool, is this technology right for me? It depends. And I want to circle back to the idea that anyone can make architecture decisions. It is not limited to architects. We have lots of job titles for architects, and they mean lots of different things. Some of these include architect in the title, but also if you are a staff engineer, if you're a technical lead, you need to be doing the architecture work. And I bring this back up because I want to say that if every engineer has to do some architecture work, I think the flip is true, that some archi all architects need to do some level of engineering and programming responsibility. In fact, this is the largest font I have in the entire slide deck because it's important. Yes, architects should write code. Some people think this is a controversial statement, but that's why I made it a large font, because it's an important decision. But if you've been paying attention, the decision carries more weight if I explain why I think that. So fine, why should architects write code? First, it's a way to validate your designs. Especially you're doing a new pattern or you don't know what you're, how it's going to behave in the wild. Get out there, write the code and realize, oh, I can't actually do the thing I thought I could do. Let's change the design and you go back and you modify your design. Because ADRs are great at walking you through the trade-off analysis, but sometimes reality doesn't enter into them and hits you like a, you know, hits you on the head and you have to change your, change your implementation. That means the architects get to share in the pain and the frustration when things don't go well. But it also means you've got skin in the game, so you get to celebrate the wins just as the rest of the team does. Now, as an industry, we've seen fewer and fewer ivory tower architects. But as I mentioned, we all went remote. And that remote work has isolation built into it. This is one more way to have an intentional interaction with the team, that you're just another member of the team, and you're working with them and getting your hands dirty pair program with people. Maybe you're not writing the code, but maybe you're pair programming and doing more code reviews and actually interacting on a regular basis because that's the critical thing you need for hybrid and remote work. It's not everyone goes into their bunker and does their work themselves and checks it in and we're all done. You still need to communicate, but you have to be intentional about it. Now, if a few bullet points isn't enough, I wrote an ADR for this. Um, check it out later. Um, now, when I say that architects should write code, I am not saying full-time. We have lots of responsibilities. One of those responsibilities that some companies I've worked for is being on the design team. I like this idea where you have different viewpoints come together. So one of them is the business owner is there to represent, business, or the product owner is there to represent business needs. And then a UX designer comes in to say, here's what the UX should look like. And then the architect takes care of the technical needs. But the roles and responsibilities and the titles don't have to line up. We need the viewpoints. That's what's important. The business, we write software to solve business needs. So that's what we are trying to build. The technical seat of the table is just trying to answer, how are we going to build it? So if you don't have an architect, then your staff engineer, your lead engineer, someone just has to be there to discuss those technical challenges. And what's great is this is a chance to get out ahead of the development team. So you might still be doing you know, two-week sprints, but look a few weeks in advance to be and start making some of the technical decisions before people sit down and say, I don't know what we're supposed to do here. So if you can figure those out ahead of time, this is a great chance to have this team discuss what kinds of technical decisions you need to solve before you hand it off to the developers and say, please implement this. I also think it's important to ask for help. Um, 
the ADR template is better than a blank whiteboard, but sometimes it helps to have someone else to talk to. And maybe there's no one else to talk to because of time zone issues, or you're the only architect, or you don't know who to talk to. Um, so where do you start when you need to talk to somebody? Well, this is where those AIs come in. You know, this is going back to Eric's keynote. Ask them. Ask them, how do, how do I make this decision? Talk to them about trade-offs. Because these are the little things that you, if, you, if you use the LLMs as a pair programmer or just a co-pilot or whatever term you want to use, I think the names are going to evolve. But as a tool to help you, you can now ask it about, I'm thinking between these two options, what are the pros and cons? And maybe you've thought through some of those things, but it might give you some ideas you hadn't. If you are really lazy, just ask it to write the whole ADR. Um, I, I have to admit that when I did this after I wrote mine, I was very pleased to see that it also concluded, yes, architects should write code. So score one for me. Um, I will say, if you haven't figured this out, don't take what it says at face value. They are often wrong. Just like you're going to ask a person and they might not know your context, maybe you'll get some useful information, but don't just assume it. So don't just check your ADR from get, uh, chat GPT into source control. Now, during the first phase of our scientific method, that's where we're doing some research. We're trying to figure out what, our, what is the decision we need to make. And that research phase requires coming up with new ways to learn what is our business domain, what is the problem we're trying to solve, what can we do? Oh, look, people who are speaking at this conference are on this slide. Um, Alberto does a great talk about event storming. That's, what I, that's the only thing I know him for. I know he does other stuff. But he's the event storming guy. And, uh, Henning is here talking about domain storytelling. Both of these are great techniques to go out and learn and explore a model that you didn't know before. And that feeds into, now I need to make the decisions. I know what we're trying to solve because I understand our business domain. What do I have to figure out? These are just two examples. There's plenty more techniques. Again, check out the conference. But architects, to level up, you have to find new ways to do every level of that um, scientific method of decision making. Um, now, here's one I like, and it's kind of, kind of out there, very much an innovator idea, but when you're working with the other people on that design team or in any of your other interactions, maybe they start seeing that those ADRs are really useful and the team's getting a lot of value out of it because we're understanding why we made these decisions. People aren't questioning them as much. There's nothing that says an ADR is only for architecture. I, that's what I said on the slide, but if you go and look at the Mater website now, they changed it to say any decision record. And that's because it's just a template and just a way to step through and make a decision. You can be, what do we want to have for dinner tonight? Could be an ADR. I don't think you should go through that, but maybe you need to. I think it's going to be more useful. In fact, the example I gave, should architects write code? That's not a technical decision, but it fit the ADR template. What I think would be useful is we start seeing things like, here are our corporate goals for the year, or these are the products that we approved and we're going to put development teams on, and which team is the right one to put on this project. I, some companies are good at communicating this around. A lot of them ha leave a lot of room for improvement. And I think if you had more of the why we decided to do something written down, employee satisfaction goes up. So like I said, crazy innovator idea. Take it out and let me know if it actually works in your company. Um, that design team, that's just one group of people that architects have to work with. And architects have to work with everyone from, as Gregor Hope describes it, the IT engine room all the way up to the CEO penthouse. And be, my advice before you get off on any floor riding that elevator, know your audience. Because what, do the, what does that person need to do what do they need to know about the decision, the information you're going to give them? And also, what do they not need to know? Because this is where executive summary is like the top line of a long report. You probably only have a few minutes to talk to the CEO, but you might have hours to talk to your development teams. You need to learn how to distill that down. What are the important things to communicate? And what can you leave out? Don't hide it. Come get to, you know, find another way asynchronously to look up the information they need it. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so check out Gregor Hope's book. I haven't interviewed him yet, but uh, somebody I need to talk to on the podcast. Um, now, it seems like every, every so when I say every software problem is a communication problem, 
I also said that's true no matter who or what is involved. And it may seem that most of what I've talked about is interpersonal communications, but it also implies to those human computer interactions and between our systems. Because think about it, when you are sitting down writing code, and I say know your audience, who do you think the audience is? The compiler, right? No, the compiler is just the first audience, and it's really opinionated, and it yells a lot if you get it wrong. There's a lot of ways to tell it what to do. Remember, we're just telling the computer what instructions to run. What's more important is the human who has to read that code later. Again, it might be you trying to figure this out. Why did they write it this way? So whenever you have two ways to write the same procedure, always favor the more human-readable approach. That's the audience you need to know. And then the computer-to-computer -computer interactions. Think about using OpenAPI to write your specification. Here's how we're communicating. Or async APIs if you have um, event sourcing or event-driven architectures. There's different ways, but you need to start specifying those communication patterns, especially if you have a lot of services talking to each other. Now, where can you find one source that covers all three of these different communication paths? Oh, it's a blue book. The subtitle of Eric's book is Tackling Complexity at the Heart of Software. Having a ubiquitous language around a bounded context gets right at two of the major problems when talking about software. What's the scope of the system or subsystem we're talking about? And what are the words we will use to describe that? You know, use the language of your business domain. Uh, talk, take the language of your business domain, use it when you're talking about the problem, and use it in your software. That goes a long way to tackling complexity and alleviating a lot of communication problems. And I also, I think this is like the third person has team topologies on their slides. So architects can no longer only deal with technical issues. You have to think about the socio-technical interactions. And team topologies embraces the idea of Conway's law and says you need to either adapt your architecture to fit your organization structure or do that reverse Conway maneuver and say this is the way the architecture needs to be built. We need to move our teams around. And when we talk about having services that have low coupling and high cohesion, we want our organization structure to also have low coupling and high cohesion. And I realize I'm just echoing what Chris Richardson said like an hour ago. So wrapping up, I want to revisit the uh, four topics we covered today. So because every software problem is really a communication problem, the biggest impact that a software architect can have is by improving communication. Know your audience, find new and effective ways to communicate with them. When you're making decisions, use architecture decision records to explain why a decision was made. Be adaptable both in how you practice architecture and in the architecture you design. And finally, be a leader by providing advice to help others make better decisions. And I'll leave you with a quote, uh, slightly modified, from Kelsey Hightower. He said engineer, but I think I've established that anyone can be an architect, so we're just going to swap the words in there. And I really think that you become that 10x architect, not when you're doing the work of 10 people, but when you make 10 other people more effective at what they're doing. And I can't think of a better description for leveling up your architecture game. Thank you. And I had lots of little footnotes. If someone wants to grab a picture of, like, here's all the links, we will find a way to share the slides later. Um, but all right. mm. let's do Q and A. We're not over time. Amazing. I mean, my phone. Yeah, I've got one minute. No, no. Okay, so to repeat the question, we have lots of teams and you're trying to centralize content. Uh, I do both because it depends. It's just like you shouldn't have microservices or monoliths. What's the right solution? For uh, decisions that affect many teams, we have one central repository. That's all it is, our Blackbaud engineering or Blackbaud architecture ADRs. And everybody knows that's where I can go. And in my code repo for my project, for my service, I have another docs decisions folder 
where I put all the stuff that is only context specific to that because they would get lost in the shuffle. Like, I'm deciding this thing for this one service because I still have decisions to be made. And if I say, I can refer to those. I can say, go look at this ADR over in that repo. And then I can relate them and say, I'm going to follow those best practices and build on it for our situation. So it depends. Always the answer. One more. So everybody hear that? Listening to understand versus listening to defend. And are you um, coming up with an argument in your head against that, or are you actually taking in the information and, and using that? So, um, the, uh, the slide I took out, because I thought it was going to be long on time, because I first did this as a 50-minute presentation, then I read it, it's supposed to be 45, was um, a tip from improv. If you know improv, it follows the idea of yes and. And that's what allows an improv scene to just keep building organically. The opposite of that is saying, yeah, but, or no. And it just shuts down, and the flow doesn't work. Like, improv doesn't work if you say no. Use that in your interactions. It, you know, accept what someone else is giving you. Don't just say no automatically. Don't have that knee-jerk reaction. I, I know I sometimes have that. I've met other architects. Like, I know what's going on. I have more information than you. They might have something. Take it, say, yeah, and, instead of, yeah, but, and see if that changes how you use their information to get to a better answer. All right, one more and then I'm gonna wrap it because I think we're over time. But I'm happy to talk to everybody afterwards. Go ahead. Well, uh, it's hard to write down things that you haven't written down. Like, um, that's a third part of dark energy matter that Chris didn't talk about. Um, but mo all architecture decisions get made, like you always have an architecture.